Broken Biden. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. You're not surprised. We talked about this all during the campaign. He lacks the integrity. He lacks competence. He's not supposed to be president. We can all see that. And it's, well, it's kind of sad. I can accept that because, quite frankly, I'm used to it. I knew it about this guy. And actually, in a weird way, I can accept that Afghanistan is now in the hands of these guys. I don't like it at all. It didn't have to happen this quickly, but it's Afghanistan. It's far away, and as long as they don't dare mess with us here, I can live with this. We have to. But something I can't tolerate, another loss for our American military. Now, we have the best military in the world, but it's led by incompetent generals and civilian staff. This is not the responsibility of the men and women, the troops. It's those who lead them. And this is a long time coming. You know, the Pentagon, my goodness gracious, it's time for a top to bottom overhaul. Start from scratch. The culture has been corrupted, possibly because the Pentagon is so close to the swamp. It's in the swamp right there, so close to those guys, those bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. They have screwed up the military. Now, we showed you yesterday how all the happy talk and uh, misinformation about Afghanistan helped put us in this fix. I think uh, that the development of the Afghan army is on a very good path right now. We, we've made tremendous strides incredible progress in the last 20 months. The solid partnership has been the thing that has been really striking for me all around the country. It's fair to ask if we're winning in Afghanistan. I believe the answer is yes, and several facts allow me to say that with confidence. And we've seen some great, great uh, progress in some of the operations based even at the tactical level on the intelligence uh, structure. They showed me the positive changes they have helped bring about, the villages they can now enter, the, the Afghan police and forces they are training and trying to improve. All this sugarcoating, all this bureaucratic talk, all this spin, we gotta stop it. It's gotta, something has to be done culturally inside the Pentagon because they did the same thing in Iraq. Another war, we blew it at the very end, but it was a long time coming. We were saying the same misleading stuff about Iraq, the generals were. Take a look at this, all the way back in 2003. Uh, the situation in Fallujah over the last two or three weeks, as we all know, has been uh, a very cooperative and uh, peaceful uh, uh, situation down there where the mayor and the police chief, in fact, have been very supportive of uh, the efforts that we have been embarked on. Uh, it is clearly a, uh, a right in a democracy for those policemen to demonstrate as they have and, uh, you know, to state their views. The police and military in Fallujah were protesting American forces, and he says somehow that's a good thing. Fallujah, I was there, was a powder keg, and yes, it did explode. Remember those contractors that they hung from that bridge? So much silly happy talk, so much misinformation from the generals. While it's been a difficult few days, uh, I can tell you that Iraqis have again risen to the occasion. Let me give you a couple of, of, of data points here. First of all, the Iraqi security forces performed well across the country, generally well. Uh, generally well. That's known. <laughs> That's, that's giving him a lot of wiggle room, okay? Generally well. This is prime bureaucratic speak. Next. Oh, remember this guy? We're also focused on developing a capable and professional Iraqi security force and helping to build civil capacity. And we're making progress in each of these areas every day. And while these efforts are progressing at a different pace, they're all moving forward in a positive and tangible manner. He was so bad, they promoted him twice to four-star general and now secretary of defense. How about this guy? The Iraqi security forces demonstrated uh, on Sunday that they're up to the task. If it were, if it were a, a test, they passed with flying colors. And I'm pretty confident that they can continue to secure um, the, the government of Iraq and, and the Iraqi people. 
Um, there's no doubt in my mind that they can do that exceptionally well. <laughs> pretty confident, pretty confident. They all remind me of Baghdad Bob. Remember him, the Minister of Information during the, uh, the invasion? Oh, we're winning, Saddam Hussein, right? He got it all wrong. They remind me so much of Baghdad Bob because the first real test for the Iraqi military in July of 2014, 30,000 Iraqi troops gave up pretty much right away to less than 1,000 ISIS fighters. ISIS rolling right over the Iraqi military in Mosul. Uh, they just <laughs> walked right in. See, here's what the military would never say about our allies in Iraq and Afghanistan. As Fred Kaplan once reported, uh, these militaries need American backing, a network of close air support, intelligence, logistics, repair, maintenance crews, rapid mobility by helicopter. You need that stuff for a real military, and they just don't have it. And that's why this all happened. Um, I'm not blaming the troops, by the way. The troops, I'm talking about the privates, to the sergeants, to the lieutenants, captains, majors, even the lieutenant colonels and colonels. I'm talking about the generals, yeah. The generals, at that high level, they failed. Most of them, there are some thoughtful ones in the mix, some who will actually risk their career for their country. You know, lots of soldiers and Marines, sailors, will risk their lives, almost all of them, but they won't risk their careers. It's kind of an interesting um, conundrum, if you will. And this goes all the way back to Vietnam, where bad news from the battlefield was often manipulated, crafted to look like good news by the time it got to the Pentagon. It's very rare for a general to go against the grain, very rare. One who did, who I like a lot, his name was General Edward Meyer. Shy Meyer was his nickname. He was the chief of staff of the Army from 1979 to 1983. And one year in 1980, he shocked all of Washington, D.C. when he came right out and said, the army that I'm in charge of is a hollow one. I mean, this was straight talk, and some of them weren't able to handle it. At one point, he threatened to turn in his four stars if he did not get what he needed to equip his army well. He was something else. What do we have now? And I personally find it offensive that we are accusing the United States military, our general officers, our commissioned, non-commissioned officers, of being, quote, woke or something else because we're studying some theories that are out there. That was started at Harvard Law School years ago, and it proposed that there were laws in the United States, antebellum laws prior to the Civil War, that led to uh, a power differential with African Americans that were three quarters of a human being when this country was formed. And then we had a civil war and Emancipation Proclamation to change it. And we brought it up to the Civil Rights Act in 1964. It took another 100 years to change that. So look it, I do want to know. The military are supposed to avoid domestic politics. He's auditioning to be a guest on Rachel Maddow's show. He did not have to say any of that stuff. And that, by the way, is in June. What's happening in June? The withdrawal from Afghanistan. He should have been planning the non-combatant evacuation operation that we're seeing right now. Such a colossal failure. <laughs> you know who saw through this guy and the others? Trump. Trump. He saw right through their act. In fact, when he showed up uh, on the USS Gerald Ford, very interesting what he saw. And uh, I'm going to have him tell you the story in a moment. But first... Steam catapults in the Navy, aircraft carriers. For decades, they launched via steam. A catapult would throw the aircraft down the deck and uh, it took steam to actually move the airplane off the ship. Well, somebody had the bright idea to change that to electromagnetic technology. Electromagnetic, okay, give it a shot. Thing is, uh, it's not working too well at all. And Trump was very familiar with this and he wanted to get to the bottom of it. And guess what? The brass, they don't like that. We built a, an aircraft carrier, and the aircraft carrier has all sorts of problems. It's the Gerald Ford. They throw the plane off, and they decide to do it through electric instead of steam, right? Catapult, it's called. So they have a catapult, and for 60 years, it's been steam-operated. 
They decide to do it. Let's make it out of electric. I went to visit the ship, and I wasn't interested in seeing the admiral. The admiral said, sir, admiral so-and-so, the thing's out to sea trials, it's not working. And I said, uh, Admiral, honestly, I think you're a wonderful man. Very good looking guy, actually. You like central casting, but I want to see the catapulters. <laughs> so I meet these five guys, real great guys. They're catapulters. How long have you been doing it, Jim? Sir, 21 years. I said, let me ask you, you have a problem with it? Absolutely, sir, it doesn't work. <laughs> Why? He said, because you, if it breaks, you have to go through graduate school at MIT to fix it. And with the steam, we had the same power or more, and we could fix it with a blowtorch and a hammer. I love that story. He's absolutely right. You know who hates that story? Hates that story? These guys, the generals. <laughs> I feel bad for that sailor who told the commander in chief the truth. Sometimes that's the last thing these guys want known. I'll be right back. You just watched Newsmax TV, America's fastest growing cable news channel now in more than 70 million homes. You can get Newsmax TV on your cable system or check your cable guide. And if your system doesn't carry Newsmax, call them, tell them you want Newsmax TV because we're real news for real people.